Um, after Eric's talk, I feel like it's the great grandkids <laughs> fooling around. Also because maybe the stand is so high, I feel really small. <laughs> um, so let's start. We thought about you know introducing our topic maybe in a different way. So um, probably most of you learned another language in your lifetime, and maybe someone even tried to tackle a new language and a new script at the same time. Um, so you might have taken some notes on the side, you know, bridging your not yet knowledge in the new system um, in your own pronunciation and your own script. Um, so that also happened in Spain during the 13th until 16th century roughly, when parts of the Arab population that was living there at the time used their own Arabic script to transcribe Romance languages like archaic Spanish. And those manuscripts can still be found today and they lay ground um, for a, you know, an, an exploration or an inter contemporary interpretation of an Arabic typeface that then, funny enough, got a Latin counterpart in the end. So what you're seeing here on the screen now, it's a uh, scan from a manuscript present in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And uh, it shows one of the spreads of the different kind of styles that were present in these manuscripts. Uh, if there's any Arab readers in the, in the audience, if you start reading, you'll notice that it's not Arabic, although it looks like Arabic. But if there's someone who knows Spanish and who knows Arabic, mm -hmm. he can read these manuscripts. <laughs> because if you read them, they sound Spanish, archaic Spanish. So um, these are called al khamiado that comes from the word al hajamiya in Arabic. And uh, I highlighted one word, which is uh, this one, which is, uh, if you read in Arabic, it reads lash, lagrimas. So from up, from right to left, lash, lagrimas. If you take the word and you take phonetically every phoneme and you switch it from right to left to left to right, it reads las lagrimas which means in Spanish, uh, the tears, al Dubuma in Arabic. So there's two languages and there's two scripts that are playing uh, like this game of coding and coding. And these were used by the Arabs that were uh, in between the transition between the Arab kingdoms the, and, and the reconquest of the Catholic Spanish kingdoms back to the Iberian, Iberian the, the, um, space. So, uh, as Andrew said, now I'm based in Madrid, and when I moved back, I felt like I'm out of my Arabic zone, I'm out of my uh, Arabic community, how I'm coming to continue doing Arabic type or whatever, inspiring, inspiring, making research. But then I, I was amazed by the amount of history that Spain has, and the amount of uh, around 600 years of Arab-Spanish culture mixing during the Arab, and, and this was one of the topics. So, these manuscripts, they are very rough, they are, they are very special because they are not as any other manuscript I saw before of any Arabic. They're not very calligraphic, they're not, they're not written by a master calligrapher, uh, they're not following a specific uh, writing style. All what we know is that they are vernacular drawings of the Andalusian Kufic script. Uh, that's, that's all. And they were written by, by, by uh, leaders or by... Uh, by people uh, that know how to write, but uh, you see that some of them are a bit geometric, some of them are a bit uh, cursive, and while doing the research, uh, uh, I was also helped by an intern uh, called Adele Gallet, and we were looking at all the different pages, and what was amazing that in the same compilation, there were different styles happening from different writers, and uh, so we said, okay, we cannot, we cannot maybe do only one typeface. Maybe we have to do different typefaces, or maybe we do one typeface that changes. Uh, so the first thing we did is we did the matrix, and we said for every letter, we're going to uh, uh, select all the different shapes that we are seeing in these manuscripts, and try to make like a skeleton out of it, or decide on it, and try to come up with a with a basic set, and then try to make the the other. So here you're seeing some of the matrices with it. Uh, like this is the meme and the lamb and the calf. Uh, 
the ha, the ya, the wow. And also we looked at uh, how the words are being written, about the context of every word, to see what ligatures to intrude, what not. So it took a while to understand these masters, but then we thought that maybe we don't do only one typeface, we do two typefaces. We do one which is more organic and one which is more geometric. And what do we need to take out of these uh, manuscripts? What is the new letters that we found that are not present in any other uh, styles that we know? So, uh, what to put in the stylistic sets, what to put in the contextual alternates, what to put in the basic set, all of these different thoughts. And this is somehow the basic set that we decided to start with. And then we started drawing, analyzing the digital version, which is really so different than the vernacular handwritten. But the idea was that we don't want to make it also rough, we want to make it really digital, really clean, like a, a really pure version of this existing, of this manuscript. And, uh, and then we were always thinking that what would be the geometric version, what would be the cursive version. So here you see, for example, the letter H, which is actually the loveliest letter, but also the letter that makes you a lot of, gives you a lot of problems. And you see that we're trying to understand how to make the differentiation between the the, the cursive and the and the kufik and the freelance one. So so here you see Okaso and Oscura. Uh, Okaso is the name of the geometric one. Oscura is the name of the of the cursive one. We gave them these names because uh, they come from the dark period, the end of the Arab period. Also, they were hidden clandestinely, and these manuscripts were hidden because they were uh, at some point uh, illegal, because um, at some point uh, the Arabs being there, they weren't uh, allowed to practice anymore their Arab culture, so they were a bit hidden. They were found later in, in wars or in ceilings in Zaragoza or in other places. Anyway, so here you see the Ha, the Saad, uh, the Dal, the Fa, um, and they look really different than what we know from from the common uh, scripts. Here you see the both of them together, and white is uh, Ocaso and green is Oscura. Also the descenders uh, changed, and some letters, the whole skeleton changed, while others, so here you see the scene and the regime in green and black. Here at the mir. And then it came to time when I, when me and Adel, we uh, made the idea of what this typeface is about, I thought, okay, now I need uh, a Latin expert to come in and to, to continue the project. So at this point, Linda came in. And Pascal asked me, he gave me the brief for the project. And when I got the brief, I had really no idea what this would end because I thought, like, my first thought is, was like, this is dangerously close to a random type cooker. Um, <laughs> so I went into Latin sources. I just looked at a lot of material to try to get an idea, like what could a rough Latin respond to Kufic look like, and uh, how? Oh, sorry. How can we use this, you know, really prominent baseline that we see in the Arabic script, and how do we deal with the concept of differing, you know, character widths within one, within one style? So all the freedom that the Arabic has. Um, I looked into a lot of things, like how do we get a bit of warmth into the project and. You know, not you know, not making it overly funny, but maybe introducing some some weird forms, make, giving it a bit of liveliness. And then, as it always happens, when you look at material, you go down the rabbit hole because you just get interested in other things. Like a rabbit doesn't have uppercase and lowercase, so you go into, you know, you end up looking at Tichol's uh, phonetical rewriting of things, and um, which is fun, but also. You, yeah, you do a lot of detours. Um, I also looked into formalized handwriting, also because Arabic is so much freer than, than our Latin rather stiff system. So I, I also looked into other, you know, freer forms of extreme ascending and descending forms and things like that. And then on the other hand, also into um, because it was non-scholars right, or non, you know, calligraphers writing the Arabic manuscripts, I also looked into like super simplified handwriting models in the Latin to 
to have an idea. So if you think of those points I just mentioned, like taking out the phonetical part as a design space or as a, you know, as basic ingredients, this is um, kind of blurry still. So I wobbled uh, around. I doodled while I was researching, trying to make, you know, just collect everything that I could find on the way um, to try to compile what an answer or an echo could be. So Ocasso was the more constructed one, and we ended up drawing, you know, alternates, like square and round. Oscura turned into an upright italic, and the project would take us places that we didn't know at that point, which was really nice. So we had a lot of discussions, and I enjoyed it a lot to, you know, try to find the same vibe for the, length, for the typefaces, to um, make them, you know, harmonize also with you know, practical things, but to, to give them the same, like, I, I, don't, I don't know when we came up with the, the, the term, but the same ocasoness and oscuraness to, to mimic mm -hmm. the same, you know, to give them the same voice. And um, I have to say that I enjoyed this process a lot. It was during the pandemic, there was not so much fun happening. We had the, key, the kids on our keyboards and marking our proofs and stuff, but this project was really, you know, fun to do in dull times. So to be a bit more specific, we talked about a lot of things, but like in the Arabic, counters can go awfully small if you use to drawing Latin type. We also discussed about how long can ascending and descending forms be before the Latin, you know, starts to be starts to look completely ridiculous. Uh, how lively can you can I get the Latin to behave without it being overly funny and trying to imitate the Arabic in some sort? No, I don't. And then Pascal came with the idea to make a slanted version that would bridge both poles, which I thought was kind of a Frankenstein idea to come up with in the first place. So that was also interesting. So we ended with a scope of kind of two families and this Frankenstein slant in the middle that would bridge the two. So in the bottom you see Ocasso, the constructed one, having alternates in straight and round. And on the top you see Oscura, which had kind of an upright italic construction to make it more lively. And in the middle you see the slanted mix. So there are some specialities we found during this collaborative process that went into different parts of the project. So Ocasso has some specialities. I, drew round and straight forms to, you know, somewhat try to fake us closer to the richness of the Arabic forms that you find in the initial, medial and final forms. It just, there's a lot more material to play with in the, in the Arabic. So I drew like square and round forms and they alternate um, depending on context. So this is the square. And then we ex can exchange some letters to round, so this is the pure round version. And then actually it mixes when it comes together. And I still, when I look at it, I still feel like this is a bit weird. But um, yeah, it kind of echoes the, the script really well. Yeah, so um, Elinda was really uh, coming up with this idea that her, because she saw a lot of geometric and curved forms in the Arabic, and uh, she noticed that Arabic is more fluent, so that's why she, she did this change between the square and round, square and round, and she did the code for it. And then the next step was that the Arabic is basically more horizontal, and the Latin, as we know, is more vertical. And uh, what is more, even in the Kufic scripts, that the horizontal, some, some of the letters, they grow uh, horizontally long in some cases. Like here we can see the Kaf, we can see the Sad. Not all the letters, only some letters and some specific letters. And we thought, okay, so, so now we merge the idea of curved and square, how can we also merge the idea of horizontal and vertical? And then we came up with the idea, okay, why don't we use the uh, variable font technology and say that, okay, why don't we uh, add a, why don't we add a, a, a stretch axis uh, to the weight axis and we allow this horizontal, um, horizontal uh, change. So here you see the, the gym and the, and the K. Um, but what is interesting about typeface is that it's not going between condensed and wide. 
Not all the letters are going to be able to be stretchable. Only the letters that accept to be uh, to be stretchable following the Kufic rules. So here you see everything that is in green are only the letters that can be stretched, and the others we cannot stretch them because if we stretch them, they will be deformed. And uh, uh, as you know, in Arabic also, when we do justified text, usually we use the idea of kashida or madda to elongate the baseline. But what is cool about this type is that beside the kashidas, you also can use this uh, feature to elongate the, the letters, and then it gives a very more neutral, uh, neutral color to the to the justified text without any long baselines. And the same idea, uh, Linda took it, and she said, "Okay, uh, how can we apply this to the Latin and to make this horizont horizontality to it?" So, and also the idea wasn't that we want to uh, expand or. Uh, stretch all the letters, so Linda decided to stretch the letters basically that are somehow the more squarish ones and they have a, a horizontal uh, stem in them. Uh, not only letters, but also ligatures. So here you can see in green what Linda decided to stretch and the white that she said maybe we don't stretch them. Um, and then here you see them together, how they work, uh, when you want to fully justify a text. and. Uh, it's a, it's a very n nice feature to, to have in a die face. And then Linda took it another step further with the idea of the <laughs> transfer. I'm enjoying the slides. Um, <laughs> um, so to, do, to be able to do the full round, we thought of adding all the characters that you need to actually transcribe Arabic names and everything into Latin. So you need some more accented characters that are, I represented, I think it's the ISO 233, if I'm not mistaken. So you need to add some accented ones. And now we can actually do the full circle, which I thought was quite important to the project. So you can transcribe in either way. So if we look at uh, Oscura, which is the more lively and the more fluid one, Oscura got some other means to come closer, or the Latin got other means to come closer to those Arabic manuscripts. So um, while Ocasa was going wide, I thought it would be a nice experiment for Oscura to be going narrower and only with parts of the parts of the um, character set. So I chose the rounds and I changed some other forms to come closer to an you know upright italic feeling. So this is the normal width, and then we change the, only the rounds, and they come. The whole thing becomes a bit more compact. So it's actually not that many. But it's a statistic set, and it just gives another voice within the same typeface. Um, we also looked at a lot of you know, opt small optimizations, and um, there's like ligatures is maybe a very obvious bridge to do to the Arabic. So some ended up in the typeface, some didn't. And uh, when we wrote them together, it felt kind of a natural thing to do. And then I also thought it would be nice to do all the accented ones and then you see things multiplying and then also there's just the IJ but I also drew one without the ingoing stroke because sometimes it doesn't really work and yeah, things pile up. So uh, after Linda started doing also the ligatures, of course, um, as you know, if some of you are Arab speakers here or Arab type designers, you know that the character set of an Arabic typeface, the ligatures are maybe five times the basic character set or this is like the logic of it, so... What was hard is that for me to decide what are the ligatures I want to include in a typeface and what I will drop off because it's not possible to put everything in. And you notice that the most common ligatures were happening with the letter Ha and its family, so Jim Ha Ha, and letter Mim and its family, uh, and also uh, the usual thing. So, uh, as, as, as you notice, also it has a bit of an uh, escalation happening, but it's very geometric because it's a very geometric typeface. <laughs> but also, uh, at, at some point, we were uh, happy with the basic character set, and then and I were coming uh, together with the Arabic and the Latin, building all the ligatures, building all the features, and seeing it uh, uh, grow together. Here you can see some of the ligatures. They are in green at the text, and you see that how often they appear in the Arabic, uh, more, more, more often and in a more uh, uh, natural way. And then Linda also took another step further. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the last experiment. So this project ended way more in the study area of typefaces than, yeah, than, than a lot of other projects I've been doing. So 
The last one was uh, the idea to hide the caps. I didn't want to draw Unicase or you know this small cappy version, but I thought you know the numbers. Do, we do it with the numbers. Some drop you know a bit down below the baseline, and um, they maybe blend a bit better. So let's try. Uh, it's one of those experiments where you think, yeah, why not try? Also to get a bit more like more generous designers because Arabic has so many of them. And if you put them next to Arabic, it seems quite okay. It's like seen worse. And then the um, but then as I mentioned before with the accents, you know, things start to multiply. And if this is useful, I have no idea, but you know, you maybe saw it coming. You also need to draw ligatures for the caps that drop down and then you also need to, to do the mix accented and I wanted on I think Andre is not here but I really wanted to thank Andre for this context for diacritics or what is called this lovely website where you actually can find out what ligatures you actually need. So um, otherwise I would probably still be drawing. <laughs> and then just for fun, uh, when preparing this talk I thought it would be nice to look at the you know naked numbers if we you know reach the point even. So um, as much as I tried with those cooler, with all those nonsensical, maybe nonsensical ligatures, I just couldn't. <laughs> Pascal won. Well, let's have <laughs> So it's, it's a fluid typeface, or it's, it might be geometric, it's also slanted. It's only one slanted for both of the typefaces. It lives between the two words, between the ge geometry and the cursor. It's a very smart idea and also a very economical idea to do one slanted for two typefaces. It's a typeface that is created by an Arab person living in Spain, collaborating with a European person, Arabic and Latin, from a study that was done on a manuscript for, from Arabs that were living in Spain, speaking a Spanish language. So it was like a, it was very like an interesting circle that we, that we did and it took us um, almost two years to do this project. And uh, at the end, we were, we were very happy to, to see it. It's not going to be like this, uh, this maybe a super used typeface for, it's not like the super legible typeface for small point size or kind of, but this is like daring typeface. It has a strong character for, for daring designers to use it, to experiment with it. And uh, we are so excited to see people using it and actually we started seeing some people using it and it's really cool like uh, how how they're really uh, using all of these nice features that we took all the hard time to work on it and to give all of our time and energy to do it and we see people using it which makes it a really uh, a good this is the best way to to be happy about your work so so that's our project thank you for inviting us and thank you for listening